If you want me to continue with my work, it is crucial to support the channel via Patreon. Moreover, make sure to subscribe to Bobby's Perspective on Rumble. All the links are in the description box below. May Allah bless you all. Alright guys, welcome back to the channel. If you're new, my name is Bobby. Guys, as a new revert to Islam, I'm of course learning every single day. Therefore, today we're going to check out the 10 worst haram things in Islam. By now, I'm fairly confident that I do know what is haram and what is halal, but nevertheless, maybe we are in for a surprise today. Guys, before we start the video, if you enjoy the content, leave me a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and check out the links in the description box below. And now, with no further ado, let's have a look. In Islam, certain activities and behaviors are considered haram, meaning forbidden or prohibited. Dangerous this zone. This is to ensure that Muslims live their lives according to Allah's teachings and avoid actions that could be harmful to themselves and others. One. Idolatry, worshipping idols or any form of association with partners in worship is considered a grave sin in Islam. Yeah, this is called shirk in Islam. This is the number one sin. However, coming from a Christian background myself, in the Ten Commandments, what do we read first? Number one is, you shall have no gods before me, which means you should worship God alone without attaching any partners to him. There is no God but God. And this is why I reverted to Islam, because as Muslims, we do believe that the Christians went wrong there. They have the Ten Commandments within the Old Testament, where it clearly describes who God is, and that there is only one God but then they attributed partners to God, be it the Holy Spirit, be it Jesus, seeing God as a trinity. You only worship besides Allah, idols, and you produce a falsehood. Indeed, those you worship besides Allah do not possess for you the power of provision. So seek Amen. from Allah provision and worship Him and be grateful to Him, to Him, you will be returned. Many Christians ask me why I reverted to Islam. Why would you revert to Islam? Christianity is a monotheistic religion as well. Listen, guys, we have to distinguish between Christianity, the Bible, and Jesus. I make the argument that we do not have the fully preserved message of Jesus in the first place. If we look into the Bible, there are certain passages attributed to Jesus, and maybe those are really things that Jesus said, maybe there are not. We don't have 100% proof for those claims. If you look throughout the Bible, you will find many passages that point towards monotheism, of course, but then other passages that show us a polytheistic way of looking at God. And, of course, a very humanizing aspect that is attributed to God as well, starting with Genesis, which is not only found within the Christian scriptures, but, of course, within Judaism. There it is described that God created the world in six days, and rested on the seventh day. In the Quran, on the other hand, we read that Allah needs no rest. And this way, Islam clearly stands out. We're not attributing any human weaknesses to God. Of course not. And moreover, it is only Islam that has the concept of shirk and tawhid. Those two concepts are complementary because you have tawhid, the pure unity of God, and then you have shirk, which clearly describes that everything that you try to add to God is not God. 2. Consumption of intoxicants. Another significant prohibition in Islam is the consumption of any kind of intoxicants. Any including kinds. alcohol, drugs, or any other mind-altering substances. Muslims are expected to refrain from the use of any such intoxicants, as it is considered a grave sin in Islam. So yet again, comparing this to Christianity, I come from an orthodox Christian background, the purest form of Christianity, if you will, but nevertheless, within Christianity, within orthodox Christianity, yes, we do have the prohibition of so-called pharmakia, which means we shouldn't take any mind-altering substances, However, this does not apply to alcohol. And this was absolutely crazy to me. When I talked to the priests, they told me that all the drugs are prohibited. You shall not touch any drug. No weed, no mushrooms, etc., etc., you name it. Fine, I agree with that. 
However, when it came down to alcohol, of course, you can enter the church and drink wine at the altar. And this was absolutely insane to me because full disclosure here, I have nothing to hide. In my past, I experimented with all kinds of mind-altering substances. And out of all those substances, I can say that alcohol is the worst. Alcohol leads to fatal car crashes, to domestic violence, to cheating, to promiscuous behavior in the first place. What do people do when they go out to the clubs on the weekends? The main drug of choice is, of course, alcohol. And when I looked into the Christian church and I saw them consuming alcohol in the churches, this was insanity to me. And the same happened when I went to the Christian monasteries. We gathered to dinner and people started drinking wine. I even saw drunk priests and monks. Drunk. Completely drunk. And this is why I say you have to distinguish between Christianity and the Bible and Jesus. Because if you look into the Bible, the Bible claims as well that a drunkard shall never inherit the kingdom of God. Which means you cannot drink and enter the kingdom of God. You're not going to get into paradise. But then the church tells you that it's a-okay to consume wine. Hypocrisy. This is because these substances are harmful to the body, mind, and spirit. 100%. Leading to damaging health effects, illegal activities, and a departure from the teachings of Allah. Yeah, degeneracy. All you who have believed, do not approach prayer while you are intoxicated until you know what you are saying or in a state of janaba. Accept those passing through a place of prayer until you have washed your whole body. And if you are ill or on a journey, or one of you comes to the place of relieving himself, or you have contacted women and find no water, then seek clean earth and wipe over your faces and your hands with it. Indeed, Allah is ever pardoning and forgiving. 3. Gambling Gambling, which includes any form of betting, or games of chance is prohibited in Islam. Muslims are expected to refrain from placing bets or engaging in any form of activity that involves the exchange of money for a chance to win a prize. And this is truly a shame. I grew up in Germany and I was surrounded by so-called Muslims and they were placing sport bets, they were in the casinos, they were gambling. I never knew that it is part of Islam to refrain yourself from gambling. I thought there is no ruling whatsoever. From a Christian background, I know as well that there is no ruling when it comes down to gambling. And therefore, growing up like that, I of course knew that gambling is bad. I saw people falling into debt, etc., etc. But I never thought that it is a commandment of God to abstain from it, let alone that it is a commandment within Islam. And therefore, I have to say yet again, Muslims in Germany, you did a poor job in conveying Islam. The Muslim Ummah in Germany has to restrain from those things first and foremost to point out a beautiful example. This is because gambling goes against the principles of hard work and earning a livelihood in a lawful manner, which yeah, is highly debt, valued in well. Islam. O oh, believers, intoxicants, gambling, idols, and drawing lots of decisions are all evil of Satan's handiwork. So shun them so you may be successful. 4. Adultery Obviously. Adultery is considered a significant sin in Islam. Muslims are expected to refrain from engaging in sexual activities outside of marriage, which is considered a sacred and lawful union in the religion. Adultery is considered a violation of the sanctity of marriage and goes against the principle of moral and ethical living and do not approach unlawful sexual intercourse. Indeed, it is ever an immorality and is evil as a way. Even though within Christianity we don't have a sharia, we don't have a law, so to speak, still it is commonly accepted, of course, that adultery is absolutely prohibited within Christianity. The same, of course, applies as well in Judaism and no wonder in Islam. This is crystal clear. And why is it so? Is it because religious people are prude and they are all so boring? No, of course not, because it destroys lives. And we see this experiment right now in the West. People commit adultery almost on a daily basis. There is absolutely no issues with fornicating around, sleeping around. 
around, going out on parties, meeting new people, just having fun. And then you see the same people falling into the other traps, into the other sins, such as alcoholism and moreover abortions and whatnot. In their 30s, most of those women that committed such acts are absolutely shattered. And then they're going to tell you, I'm going to be a dog, mommy. Five. Reality. Reality Can't even say this nowadays without being banned. Sexual conduct between individuals of the same sex is prohibited and is considered a grave sin. The Quran refers to this as lustful desire and it is considered against the natural order of things. Prominent Muslim scholar Sheikh Yusuf Al Qaradawi states the following The spread of this depraved practice in a society disrupts its natural life pattern and makes those who practice it slaves to their lusts. Absolutely correct. Depriving them of decent taste, decent morals, in a decent manner of living. We have to be very, very careful what we say here on this platform. Therefore, I'm going to be as PC as possible. First and foremost, objectively speaking, in the three Abrahamic faiths, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, we have the same perspective on homosexuality. All three religions regard homosexuality as sinful behavior. The Sheikh in the video said it correctly. Those people become slaves to their lust. Why is that so? Let's dissect this. If you are in a committed marriage, of course you can have sex to enjoy the company of your partner. Nothing wrong with that. However, the main purpose of sex is crystal clear. It is about making children. This is how it works. And if you treat it as such and you don't pervert it into just lustful behavior, it will stay productive. It will stay fertile. A man and a woman, they're coming together. They're having sex for the sake of procreation. After that, the body of the woman changes. She becomes pregnant. Her shape changes. Her mood changes, etc., etc., you name it. However, once the woman is impregnated, it becomes crystal clear to the man as well what he has done and what function sex serves. Yes, yet again, it is beautiful. It is a beautiful bond between man and woman. However, the purpose is to procreate, to create children. And if you are in a committed relationship and your main focus is your family, building a strong family of believing children in this sense, then your lust becomes secondary. As a productive father, you wake up in the morning, you work, you're building houses, communities, you're creating a beautiful family, you're teaching your children, you're occupied with so many things. However, if you practice same sex, what are you really building? You're not building anything because you cannot build a family. It is impossible. And therefore, the only reason for your sexual intercourse is pleasure. That's it. In the Quran we read, Have you seen he who has taken his own desires as God? This is what it boils down to. You're not interested in creating a family. You're not interested in building a legacy. You're only interested in getting your load off, in satisfying that need. This is all you care about. And this is why if you start engaging in such sexual behavior, it is a downward spiral. All you're chasing is your desires. The story of the people of Prophet Lut, Lot, peace be upon him, as narrated in the Quran, should be sufficient for us. Prophet Lut's people were addicted to this shameless depravity, abandoning natural, pure, lawful relations with women in the pursuit of this unnatural, foul, and illicit practice. That is why their Prophet Lut, peace be upon him, told them, What of all creatures do you approach males and leave the spouses whom your Lord has created for you? Indeed, you are people transgressing all limits. 6. Interest Riba Interest or Riba is strictly prohibited in Islam. Any transaction involving interest or usury is considered unlawful as it goes against the principles of fair trading 
and sharing profits justly. Yet again, I have to be very careful in what I say here because we do not want to upset certain people. However, if you look into riba, if you look into debt, if you look into the banking system, if you look into the families that created the banking system, you will always find the same pattern. Follow the money. It will show you who is behind the system and it will show you why the system is so godless. If we eradicate interest, we already solved half of the puzzle. You have to understand this. And this is why I find it so sad when so-called truth seekers do not see this issue. It is the elephant in the room. If you're truly a truth seeker, you look down the rabbit hole, you've been rat pills, then of course you will understand who runs the show. And if you know that, you will find Islam as well. That was one of the pathways that I took. I saw who the bad guys are in this equation, and I saw who was fighting evil. It was the Muslims. It is the Muslims. It is only the Muslims. The Christians, they're siding, of course, with the military-industrial complex. And they're fighting actively against the Muslims. So if you follow down the rabbit hole, you will see who the good guys are, who the bad guys are, and then you will see that the only solution is Islam. There is no other religion prohibiting riba. Islam encourages trade and commerce that is based on mutual benefit and fairness for both parties. 7. Gossiping and Slandering Gossiping and slandering are considered sinful in Islam. Muslims are expected to refrain from talking behind the backs of others or spreading rumors that could be harmful to others. The Quran strictly prohibits spreading rumors or engaging in any form of behavior that could lead to defamation of another person's character. All I have to say about this point is, I wish we would see more Muslims adhering to this type of behavior on YouTube. Allah prohibits in the Quran by comparing it to the disgusting act of cannibalism. O oh, you who have believed, avoid many negative assumptions. Indeed, some assumption is a sin and do not spy or backbite each other. Would one of you like to eat the flesh of his dead brother? You would hate it, so hate backbiting and fear Allah. Indeed, Allah is accepting of repentance and merciful. Let this be a beautiful reminder to all of us, guys. Because let's be honest here, man. If you're talking to somebody and that person is talking smack about another person behind their back, you can be sure that they're doing the exact same thing to you. So why would you engage with such a person in the first place? And the same applies as well to YouTube videos. Even if you're just watching those videos where Muslims talk bad about other Muslims, you're supporting the backbiting. 8. Theft Needless to say. Theft or any deceitful behavior involving taking something unlawful that belongs to someone else is strictly prohibited in Islam. Muslims are expected to respect the property and belongings of others and should avoid any action that results in the loss or harm of another person's property. It's of course self-explanatory that we should not steal. The same applies to Christians as well. In the Ten Commandments you read, you shall not steal. Therefore, this is a universal rule for obvious reasons. However, I would like to get into the Sharia and the perception of it in the West. The Westerner will say, oh, it is barbaric to chop off hands for stealing. But is it truly? Think about it. Do you want to live in a society where you have absolutely no real penalty for somebody stealing? It is, of course, a huge crime if you think about it. The mother of my wife, they went to the airport in France and she got robbed by an adult, physically fit young man. This man has absolutely no need to steal from an elderly lady in her 60s. How is this justified? Of course, it is not justified. No, it is atrocious and it is a huge sin. Therefore, if we see this as something wrong within our society, why wouldn't we punish it harsher? If you have so little punishment for stealing, it will happen again and again and again. And you see that in the West. Pickpocketing is rampant. And therefore, I'm really wondering why people have such a problem with the ruling of chopping off hands. If anything, this would discourage people from further theft. And this is an amazing thing. Are you a thief? I'm not a thief, so I don't care what happens to the thief. 
because I know I'm not stealing. My children are not stealing, thank God. My father was not a thief. So what are you worried for? Do you want to encourage thieves in your society? Nine, I really don't get it. Murder. Killing another human Obvious. being, except in cases of self-defense or in the name of justice, is strictly prohibited in Islam. The sanctity of human life is considered invaluable and every human being is expected always to preserve human life. Whoever kills a soul, unless for a soul or for corruption done in the land, it is as if he had slain mankind entirely. And whoever saves one, it is as if he had saved mankind entirely. So yet again, this rule applies in Christianity and in Judaism as well. You shall not kill. However, within Islam, it is more precise. It tells you in self-defense, it is of course okay to kill. Obviously, in Christianity, they tell you it is not good to kill. Then on the other hand, they are going to war in the Old Testament. Then they tell you you shall point to the other cheek if you are hit. So it is very, very confusing. On top of that, you do have the Crusades, so Christians killed after all. So therefore, the question becomes yet again, what is right, what is wrong in Christianity? Islam is not vague at all. We have clear rulings for what is halal and what is haram. 10. Consumption of pork. Muslims Duh. are forbidden from consuming pork products as it is considered unclean. This is mentioned in the Quran and is considered a significant taboo among the followers of Islam. He is only forbidden to you dead animals, blood, the flesh of swine, and that which has been dedicated to others other than Allah. A little fun fact here on the side, when I lived in Germany, the only thing I knew about Islam is that pork is prohibited within Islam. This wasn't due to my ignorance alone, because when I looked at the Muslims in my environment, the so-called Muslims, the only thing that they really considered haram was eating pork. They drank alcohol, they smoked cigarettes, they fornicated, were taking drugs, were involved in all kinds of criminal activity, but then they said, pork is haram, bro, I'm Muslim. But whoever oh, is course. forced by necessity, neither desiring it nor transgressing its limits, there is no sin upon him. Indeed, yeah, that makes sense. Allah is forgiving and merciful. This is a beautiful display yet again where Islam is absolutely precise, absolutely concise and crystal clear. It tells you swine is prohibited. You shall not eat it. However, if it is a life and death situation, you are dying in a desert, you have nothing else to eat and out of a sudden a pig pops up. Yeah, well, then by all means eat the damn pig, of course, because it is a survival situation. The reason why I'm mentioning the desert is you have Paul on his way to Damascus going through the desert. And out of a sudden, after not eating for three days, he has a vision of Jesus in which Jesus tells him, hey, eat whatever you will, basically, right? So couldn't this have been, if it happened the way that they describe it, a survival situation? Because Jesus Christ, may peace be upon him, certainly did not eat any pig during his lifetime in this Jewish environment. Of course he did not. Moreover, he said he came to fulfill the law and he wasn't here to break the law. <laughs> and within the law you find as well which animals shall be clean and which animals shall be filthy for you, swine being one of them. So therefore, yet again, you have so much contradiction within Christianity. On one page it says, the swine shall be filthy for you. And another page says, eat whatever you want. Nothing defiles you that exits your mouth. How does this make sense, man? These 10 haram actions in Islam are considered sinful and are strictly prohibited for followers of the religion. Muslims are expected to maintain their behavior and conduct according to the teachings of the Quran and the traditions of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. It is important to note that while these things are considered haram in Islam, our religion also emphasizes forgiveness and redemption and encourages individuals to strive for self-improvement and moral excellence. All right, guys, this is it for today's video. As I mentioned throughout it, I was already familiar with all of those 10 points mentioned. The reason being is I actually read my Bible back in the day as a Christian. And therefore, within Christianity, pork is not haram. However, within the Old Testament, in the Bible, 
pork is haram. And the same applies as well to the rest of those harams. You will find every single point of those within the Bible. And I personally believe, I'm not a scholar, this is my opinion, that we can find glimpses of the true message within the Bible as well. After all, there has been revelation of God and people then corrupted it, of course, and bended it to their will, especially Paul in the later days. However, you can find all of those halals and harams within the Bible as well, if you have the eyes to see. And therefore, back in the day, when I was a teenager, I opened up the Bible, I saw that the swine shall be filthy for us, and then I looked around and saw all the Christians eating pork. This is when I saw that they are hypocrites, and this is when I saw I have to stop with it. And this is why I stopped eating pork over 20 years ago by now. So therefore, I want to make this point very, very clear. Oftentimes you read in my comment section, Ah, oh, mashallah, Bobby, you have so much knowledge about Islam. No, I don't. I'm not a scholar and I'm not pretending to be very, very humble here. I really do not have much knowledge about Islam. I just reverted. Yes, I read the whole Quran. I'm reading Hadith. I'm reading other excellent works of Islamic scholars. But nevertheless, I do not have much knowledge. I come from a Christian background. I read the Bible. I visited the monasteries. I went to the pilgrimages. And so therefore, I reflected upon the three books, the Torah, the Bible, and the Quran. And once you do that, you see a red thread. It becomes crystal clear to you what is halal and what is haram. But to say that I have some extraordinary knowledge about Islam would be plain wrong. I want to urge you, if you guys are seeking Islamic knowledge, go to an Islamic scholar. The channel is still called Bobby's Perspective and therefore all I'm doing here hence is sharing my perspective and documenting my way. You can see that on my channel, at least in the videos that are not deleted by YouTube. You can see how I was a vegan, a raw vegan, into bodybuilding, shamanism, new age and what not. Finally, coming into Islam, alhamdulillah. All right, guys, but this is it for today's video. If you liked it, leave it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed already, guys, please do so. And if you want to support this channel via Patreon, for example, all the links are in the description box below. Thank you so much for your ongoing support, guys. And as always, may God bless you all. Much love and peace.